Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your incredibly punchy fight master, and uh, today we'll be playing episode 2 of Xenoclash, which, I mean the game's not divided into episodes, but you know, it's the second episode of me playing it, so let's go with that. One of the interesting things about the fact this game is in the Source engine is that um, you don't actually need really to save your game. The level select basically lets you start from any level in the game, and you don't miss any cutscenes, as far as I can tell, if you start at whatever level you like. So you can really just pick and choose and start wherever. Uh, we will be starting where we left off. I hope our trail is harder to follow in the woods. By now Rimat must be up and telling your hundreds of brothers and sisters to come after us. Father and mother had many children, but we are not hundreds. Oh, you're not hundreds. We're pretty safe then, huh? <gasps> What's that noise? He is one of the Corwood of the Free. One of those crazy people? Cack, if this place is full of Corwoods, I'd rather go back to Halston. They're not so bad. Look, he has his mind set on headbutting things, and nothing will change his mind about that. But why would he do that? Why not? Watch out! So I mentioned last time that this game has very clear painterly influences and that the developers explicitly name-checked um, Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch in the Garden of Delights as a particular influence. The uh, Everything is unique and there's lots of weird little details. Um, aesthetic is one that is present throughout the game, however... The Garden of Delights intertext is most explicit here in uh, the sequences featuring the Corwood of the Free. Who are... well, we're going to learn about them today. They are very strange... culture of monomaniacs, I guess? They're also a pain in the ass to fight because they always come at you in groups. Which, I mean, I guess everyone in the game does, but... Um, you know, when you fight hasten militias later in the game, they tend to have... <laughs> a little bit more in the way of um, diverse fighting styles, whereas the Corwood really do just uh, run at you like wiry little bastards and uh, cause problems. Also, I think they all wear masks, which may or may not be important as we go along. Notice again that all of the enemy designs in the game are completely unique. It was uh, explicitly a design choice. The team, when the team decided to make a uh, first-person brawler, they reasoned, well, you're going to be fighting a lot of the same people. It sucks when you play a game and you just have to fight, like, six of the same person in the same fight at the same time. It's dumb and it doesn't make sense. Well, then we have to design a lot of individuals. Okay, well, if we're defining a lot, designing a lot of individuals, then uh, then it's going to need to be showing up again and again because nobody has dev time to make 2,000 unique enemies for every random asshole you fight in every, you know, fighting game. I am not good at fighting this guy. I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna... Nope, that didn't work. So he's kind of the most dangerous one of this group. Um, he's really tough to, to fight because you sort of... You can't hit him because he backs away that way. He's got very low stamina, which is useful, but he does just smash the absolute shit out of you. Um, anyway, because of these design, you know, imperatives, they <laughs> actually developed um, combat mechanics for individual fighters based on their personalities, which they developed based on their appearances. This is most notable with uh, this guy. Well, not this guy. I mean, that guy, the headbutting guy. If you look closely, he has a crest on his head, which looks a lot like the crest of the Pachycephalosaurus dinosaur. Um, it's pretty easy to imagine that they thought, well, this guy looks like a dinosaur famous for headbutting. I guess he'll do headbutts. But he's also quite skinny and wiry, so he has this sort of cringing fighting style where he's constantly dodging dodging backwards on his on, on a horse, you know? Even this one seems to be wearing a really thin, narrow mask. The Corvid also have, a lot of them have these quite irritating, fast, spinny combos. 
If you get hit by one of those, you'll probably get hit by a few more, and if that happens, you'll lose a lot of hit points, and possibly get knocked down, which is not ideal. Unlike you, all of the NPCs can have the ranged attack whenever they want, because they can just throw shit at you. Well, I say throw shit, they throw rocks, let's be honest. One advantage to fighting the Call Aid as a rather heavier fighter is that, um... They tend to sprint right at you, which lets you get away with uh, some nonsense, like using those incredibly heavy charged punches. So, it's going to be the end of this fight in a second, and hopefully I'll remember to talk more about stuff later. Alright, get wrecked, fucko. Uh, are we good? Yep, we're good. The Corwits are not slaves of reality, so... They can be insane. You almost seem to admire them. I was a Corwit of the Free. Nah, come on. It is true. This is where I've been most of this last month. So, was it the Corwits who made you kill Father Mother? Was that it? No, it's not like that at all. But what did you do here? What's so special about these crackpots? I don't get it. It's not easy to explain. I'll tell you what I can about the Corwids I met. One of them was Erminia. Erminia peed on herself and starved to death anonymously. And that is what Erminia did. It because Corwids are not slaves of their needs, of eating or sleeping. There was also Gabel. Gabel ate people, and that's just what he had to do. The Corwids are not slaves to morality or common sense. So, if I were like Animasta, I would have let Gabel eat me. But I didn't feel I had to be eaten. Note that while he's with the Corwid, he is also wearing a mask, but also note that he has that weird tattoo on his face. It's supposed to evoke the shape of a skull, um, and it's the same tattoo as Metamorph has, but I always felt like it made him look like he had a fussy little moustache, like some kind of, uh, you know, like low-level management at an accountancy firm. You know, it makes him look like an incredibly aggressive combat accountant, let's say. Can we? Hello. So what I was trying to talk about before that cutscene was that uh, there's kind of a... There's all these different painterly influences, but one of the major influences, according to the developers, um, was actually Frank Oz, and specifically the uh, world of the Dark Crystal, that uh, classic animation... Puppet? Is, is it animation of its puppets? That uh, classic puppet-based fantasy film from the 80s. Um, the specific influence is that, well, they said that there's something really remarkable about the world created in that film, which is that even the plants and the rocks don't look like plants and rocks do on Earth, which means that you have this sense of it being a completely different, strange other world. The team, uh, or specifically the head artist, wanted to take that kind of energy into this setting that they were developing for this game. I don't think they achieve it quite as well as Frank Oz did, because while almost everything is unique, oh, you know, the ground looks like ground, the rocks look like rocks, the trees look like trees, even if the rest of the plants do look weird and interesting. So it's curious that they, um, you know, they had this particular intent in that instance, but then they did not actually fully, fully commit to it. Although I guess these rocks are pretty weird. <laughs> so I just want to nip around the back here before we actually fight Gabelle, because this is the Easter egg. It's quite hard to see properly, but... Yep. This is... Uh, they're just healing items like any of the other healing... Uh, healing plant fruit things in the game. But they are pretty, and you get an achievement titled something like Finding Easter Egg. <laughs> So Gabel here is the first of the um, heavyweight enemies in the in the, uh, in the game, which is frustrating because they are very frustrating to fight. I honestly I think they're badly designed for the game 
as it is. Traditionally, when you fight a heavy enemy in any kind of an action game, you have a... You kind of need to dodge out of the way, let them run into a wall, stun themselves, and then you hit them from behind. The trick with these guys is that you have to hit them with a heavy weapon to hurt them. However, if you hit them with a heavy weapon from other than certain angles, they will block it like that and counterattack. And that counterattack will knock a huge amount of your health off and uh, can like not send you flying. But they don't stun themselves when they uh, when they charge into things. So the objective is to hit them a couple times with a heavy weapon, which will knock them down. Having knocked them, well, no. <laughs> wow. Okay, butt punch. So uh, the objective is to hit them a few times, which which stuns them. And once they're stunned, then you can land an extra extra heavy attack on them. But this ability of theirs to block your attacks from the side and the front, and the fact that they actually move pretty fast, and the fact that you can't really judge distance very well with uh, a melee weapon, means that it's very easy to get your ass absolutely out of here. Obviously this is one of those things that can be solved by just getting good. Um, there's a lot of those in games in general. Is he? Okay, that's concerning. So it looks like he actually has a tiny bit of health left, even though... Um, even though I used up the sword. The swords are kind of... The, the heavy weapons are supposed to be tuned, essentially, so that you do the right amount of damage so that this sort of thing doesn't happen. Can I hit him with the broken bit? Oh, apparently, yeah. Well, that's all for him. What the hell was I talking about? Oh, I was talking about the Dark Crystal, but it's time for a cutscene. I'm still not sure I get it. There's more. Here, I met Oxometer. Oxometer just walks in a straight line without letting anything change his path. And that's what Oxometer does. There was also Helm. Helm needed to be invisible. So he removed the eyes from anything that could see him. <laughs> Luckily, he never became invisible to me. So you kind of have to wonder what the lives of the Corbid are like. They seem to just be constantly kicking the shit out of each other for no reason. Is that because, you know, if you... Um, if, you know, you're, the only component of your cultural identity is that you do whatever you have a whim to do at any given moment, then from time to time someone's going to get a whim to punch someone. And hey, if someone punches you, you suddenly have a very strong desire to punch them back. So, perhaps they just kind of, um, essentially end up stuck in these long chains of fights breaking out. Kind of like a tantrum spiral in Dwarf Fortress, if anyone's played that. Or maybe it's because they don't recognise Gat as one of their own, so they fight Gat a lot. After all, they do only seem to be fighting around him. We'll see them at other points. Um, in other memories, because don't forget this game is told in a um, non-chronological fashion. It does a lot with flashbacks, such as this one we're in right now, jumping to different points in time while also progressing the present day timeline. Uh, it's not especially complex, but it is interesting, especially considering games very rarely try to experiment with non-linear storytelling. So this pit down here is basically one of my deepest desires. Oh shit, I'm stuck. Oh, this is bad. Oh, no. oh, okay, no, I'm all right. Ah. So one of my deepest desires with this game is to eventually knock one of these guys into that pit. It's basically what I've always wanted to do on this particular map and I've never achieved it. I've never managed to use the, the throw on a stunned opponent. I've never managed to knock them flying with a heavy attack. I've never managed to twat them in with that sword that, that they dropped back here. It must be possible. I'm sure it's possible, but I've never made it work, which is tragic, really. Um, 
I honestly find these fights quite tiresome, in all honesty. Actually, something else I want to point out while we're here is the quality of the sound design. It's not immediately obvious always, but... Um, the sort of manic yells and panicked giggling, it really has a certain energy to it. And um, also note that characters who happen to be wearing, for example, a weird stitched together helmet have crowing voices, very much as if they were wearing a pot on their head. Alright, that's these guys dealt with. It's really satisfying whenever you hit one of these anti dizzle bird people right on the beak. Um, which I guess is a good thing for a brawling game to have, satisfying combat. It is also combat that you can get good at, which is another thing to appreciate. So, um, hmm, did I have anything more to say about the artistic influences? I'm not actually sure. I take notes. I'm, I'm a professional. I love the faces on these rocks. Also, note that if a heavy enemy runs into a rock like that, they will knock it into you, so, um, they're not actually there to help you in that fight with Gamble. They are there to help him. Which seems kind of unfair. So one of the reasons I love this game, aside from how weird it is and how many influences it has and how very willing it is to step outside the norm of game development with its, you know, artistic desires, artistic influences, its strange non-linear plot, its world that almost seems allegorical at times. Is this is this intended to send messages? Is this a allegorical tale? A philosophical philo, philo, blah, blah, blah. Let's try that again. A philosophical treatise? Or even a kind of a political text? Because if you wanted to, there is a deep reading you could make um, in this game on the difference between the Corvid of the Free and uh, a character we'll meet a lot later on and his kind of whole situation called yes. Golem. So this guy is normally not that difficult to fight. Um, however, normally I do just kick the shit out of him with this sword. So well, it's not a sword; it's a weird club. But you know, because I mean. he's kind of set up in that cutscene as being a really intimidating threat. But um, if you time it right, you can just hit him four times and he dies. Sadly, I did not do that. I hope there's some healing items around. Anyway, that's all for him for now, at any rate. What the hell was I talking about? Oh yeah. For example, it would be very easy to make a political analogy about the... Uh... Okay, like, bear with me here because I'm not, like, good at politics or political philosophy or just political knowledge in general. But um, you could easily say something about the way that the total freedom of the core is actually just a separate kind of chains. You're free to do whatever you like, provided what you what what you do is exactly what you want to do at that moment. Whatever your cu current compulsion happens to be, you have to follow that compulsion. If you aren't a slave to your needs and wants and desires, or your body's, you know, requirements to exist, then you do just starve to death and piss on yourself. Is that better than any alternative? Is that really the way you want to live? Especially in face of um, the characters later and areas of the world that we'll see later, it would, as I say, be really easy to make a kind of an allegory for... Um, you could say total anarchy, but it's really more like a cartoon of libertarianism. Not that libertarianism isn't inherently cartoonish with this concept of just total absolute freedom and uh, no no rules, no hierarchy, just do what you want forever. And um, later on the total control event evinced by a certain character representing, say, fascism. I don't think it is worth making that uh, deep reading. So I'm not going to talk about it again, except maybe I will, who knows. You know, let's uh, let's live like a Corbid of the Free and go with whatever our instincts tell us to do in any given moment. Uh, one coughing fit later because I am still very sick and I am still occasionally... Christ, it's been nine months and I'm still getting flare-ups of post-viral syndrome. Or long COVID or whatever you want to call it. 
That sucks pretty bad. As is this guy. Why are you such an asshole? I do like that they show us um, a wider variety of uh, corwids than they have to. It's clear that not all of the corwid are malevolent or vicious the way that this guy is, or Gabel is. For instance, Oxamata just does his thing. And his thing is completely harmless to everybody. Right, let's see if I can get this guy. So, I think it's more interesting to consider the uh, the Corwid more of a, a, a less direct metaphor, not, not any kind of um, direct political intention. Although, maybe in my research I should have looked up what the political situation in, Ch situation in Chile in 2009 was, because, hey, these things have influences and effects. Uh, this game, the developers, uh, Ace Team, are Chilean, just, you know, to explain my previous comment. But Metamark is the one I remember best. Metamark wanted to teach me everything he knew, and he was also trying to hurt me. I don't know the reason. Maybe he didn't need a reason. What have you learned? Carry more skills than you will be ready. Ready for what? Carry more skills than you will be ready. First, use your strong punch to break your enemy's defense. Use that moment to kick. This might be the last we see of the uh, punch down. Which is what I'm you going to call Metamot from now on. Now you will use that. Hit me from the side while you evade. <laughs> so I've failed to land that a few times against Corwood. These skills are a lot more useful in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Good. Now you are ready. Just had to throw in one little passing jab there. He's never done that before. I think that might have been a like a little AI mistake. So, um, yeah, just to finish my thoughts about the Corwid. I think it's probably a commentary to say that people think freedom is great. Well, no, that sounds fashy. Um, I think it's more of a thing to say that if you are completely subject to your own base desires, if you give in to your every whim the moment you experience it, that's just a different kind of chains and it will ultimately be detrimental to you. Maybe self-control, maybe actually, you know, being a goddamn adult about things is sensible. Maybe a halfway decision between various different ways of being is better. Maybe. Maybe sometimes it's good to take care of yourself even against your better interests. Or, no, maybe it's occasionally better to pay attention to your better interests rather than do whatever the fuck you feel like doing. It's um, less of a hot take perhaps, but possibly still a useful one. So this hallucinations fight can actually be really difficult and really easy because unlike most of the other fights against multiple opponents, uh, you never actually have the opportunity to clear out a bit of breathing space. There are always three of them and more of them will keep spawning in. Occasionally in front of you when you're trying to punch a different guy, I guess. Which was heroic of that one hallucination, I guess. So... Yeah. I think I've actually run out of things to say at the moment. I like Metamox's design, but I do find it harder to read than a lot of the other designs in the game. Why does he have that weird red foot? What does it mean? What is it supposed to be, even? 
he's got like a weird maybe it's like a wooden replacement for a missing limb Ow. are there four of them nope still three oh, just got me from behind when i wasn't looking so you've passed the test that means you can now have another test Metamox kind of like if an orc watched too many kung fu movies. But yeah, a lot of the advanced techniques you get taught in this section are really only useful against a single opponent. It's a lot harder to do things like time blocks and dodges when you're dodging multiple people because if they hit you during your dodge, or while you're trying to time your dodge for something else, uh, you kind of do just get hit by both things. And that, that kind of sucks. High aggression is generally better in this uh, in this combat system, but it can be a problem, especially since so many of the timings are kind of ambiguous and hard to spot. There's that core with spin kick that you don't get to use. Although I think the uh, masterpiece edition, no, that's not what it's called, the definitive edition, something like that actually uh, gives you one new attack in addition to the other things that it uh, provides. You can do some kind of a spin kicky attack. You can, I guess, complete your uh, core with destiny. One of the things I really enjoy about this game is Gat's kind of... Char I love how characterful they are, all are. Despite how strange they are and how awkward a lot of the voice acting is, a character like Gat genuinely has an interesting personality. I love his, his fascination with the Corwid and the fact that he's decided to become one of them. He's fled everything he knows. And a lot of the scenes in the intro cutscene, which you will have seen last episode, actually we learn about them as the as the story goes along. We learn about why these things have happened. We learn what those scenes meant. As uh, as he told the Ardra, he spent a, he spent his last month back here with the Corwid, apparently now his people. Because, let's not forget, he's con definitely considered one of Father Mother's brood. And, uh, yes, I will be talking about Father Mother a lot more later on. I wonder if they have a taboo about taking their helmets off. So, um... I was saying something important. Can't remember what it was. Also, a nice little... Oh, I was talking about Gat and his personality. I like that he admires them, but I also like that he has this kind of wry humour to him that also ties with a sort of a fatalism. He doesn't trust... Essentially, he doesn't trust that the world isn't going to be a terrible place. He wants to run away from his problems, which is why he goes to the Corvid in the first place. And as you see in that opening cutscene, he has a little map of the world, which is, incidentally, the map you see in the loading screens during the game. I love the detail that those loading screens are. A, the map of the world. B, they show you where you are in it for this next sequence that you're about to enter. And then C, they also show you um, all the places you've been and how far you've gone. So, um, spoilers, but trigger warning for a, a suicide scene in a moment. That might not be comfortable for you or to your taste, so I'm just bringing that up now. And then he killed himself. That's a cack and weird story. If that is what the Corwood of the Free are like, I don't want to stay here. We can go past the woods, farther away. Beyond the desert? No one ever comes back from there. Maybe that's not so bad.
So that is going to be all for today, but before we go, I want to talk about that really quickly because I think it's interesting. There is no explanation explicitly in the game as to why Metamilk decides to do this thing, which means you can read a lot into his character about why he may have done that thing. Arguably, he decided that you had surpassed him and that therefore he was no longer necessary. But he beats you in that fight. That is a forced fail sequence. You always lose that fight. His line about perfection would imply that maybe he trained you because he needed to make someone as strong as him and then defeat that individual in order to show that he had reached the highest, you know, capacity for combat that anyone could possibly have. And then having reached perfection, if he destroys himself, no one can ever overcome him because he will always have been the best. In the end, he was the only person who could defeat him, but also if no one can try and fight you because you no longer exist, then you will never be beaten because no one will ever know for sure that you weren't better than them. This kind of brings a sort of a malicious component to his father figure nature towards Gart, because Gart definitely sees him as a kind of a surrogate father, um, having left father mother's family. But if that's the case, then he was only being raised as a tool for Metamok's own, perhaps in his mind, sort of apotheosis as a kind of a perfect individual. So I think it's really interesting to investigate these motivations and think about them, but we will never ever see any further explanation textually as to why that might have happened. That is all for today. There's no easy way to break this, so you get a tiny, tiny little hint of the beginning of the next episode, but that will all be all from me from today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.